Hello and welcome to another instalment of History Hack. We're going medieval today. Alina, tell us about it. We have a returning person with us today. Today we've got Gabby Story. You might remember her for a couple of weeks back. She's a medievalist and historian and she's recently passed Aviva and she's now Dr. Story. Congratulations. Woo! Woo! Yeah. Oh, you, so before you did Badass Queens, you did Matilda, didn't you? And yeah. Eleanor. Yes. Awesome. What are you going to do today? We are doing that. We're doing, we doing Badass today? Queens today. Oh, boom. More badass medieval queens. People loved that, though. That was so popular. Thank you. But, um, yeah, so today I was kind of thinking we'd delve onto another bit of badass queens and looking at when they get to actually properly rule. Yes, yeah, so we're doing when... regent queens, aren't we? Yes. Yeah. We're doing some queening. Queening. Some queening. actual ruling. Yeah, absolutely. So it's all kind of like delving into when the king's either not there or when he's disappeared for a bit. And yeah, we're going to kind of delve into what happens when the king's not about, basically. Ooh. So before we start, I, I always say like we've got lots of uh, people in America that might not. And it's not that Americans are stupid, but you've never had a royal family. So can you just explain um, to the Americans and others, what is a regent? Who gets to be one? Why do they exist? Um and always, is it always like the same person that's recruited to be a regent? Okay, so a regent is a person who's nominated either by the ruler, so in this case, typically the king or the government, to rule on behalf of a monarch. So in this case, the monarch could be incapacitated, so they're not mentally or physically fit to rule, which we kind of saw with Henry the Sixth um, during the Wars of the Roses, because he had periods of like mental instability. Um, <laughs> I, just, I always <laughs> laugh my head off it I know it's bad so they think now it was catatonic schizophrenia don't they but they basically yeah. he was in a trance at some of the battles and they wheeled him out on a chair and just put some soldiers around him so they could say he was there but yeah 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 I um, like that his wife presented him with a baby in that period and no yeah. one thought hmm Nothing of it at all. Yeah, no. so that's uh, one instance where you could have a region. You might also have it if you've got like a minority, so a child king, which we have a couple of times in the medieval period. But regarding the actual term of region and regency, it doesn't come into common use until the 14th century. Before that, the language is a bit vague as to what these people were doing. Um how what arrangements were in place it's not very formalized and there's not much documentation kind of saying are they acting as a regent uh what's the actual process that's going on here for the people who are acting on behalf of the male ruler in the medieval period and it's also quite interesting to like know how the arrangements are different depending on the position of the monarch so for example if you know the king's going to be traveling if they're going to be ruling elsewhere it's a bit simpler to organize that because the king's got it's compass mentor, so to speak. He's in mm. full capacity. Whereas decisions that need to be made on behalf of a child king or a monarch who's not um, in full capacity could be beset with like factional disputes and rival parties kind of vying for control. But Catherine Parr did it for Henry VIII, didn't she? When he buggered off to Boulogne when he was old and very nearly dead. Um, he sort of nominally said, left her in charge, didn't he? Yeah, absolutely. So she was a bit different to the ones I'm going to be speaking about in that she has um, the support of the council there's a kind of full support of the government around her for example so she's not just doing it solely I think the last time we had it was it George the fourth being regent for George the third when he was non-compass mentors yes yeah absolutely Uh, I was going to bring him up a little bit later as kind of a modern reference because I'm aware you've probably got quite a lot of viewers um, and listeners who are much more a favour of kind of the modern monarchy than they might be with some of the medieval ones. Yeah, but we have to change that. We have to we have to get more medieval history on History Hat, don't we, Elena? We do. Do you know, as you guys are just talking now, I'm kind of thinking that my view of a regent was always this really powerful woman and she's taken over from her child and she's going to throw him away because she wants all the power and all of this drama and I'm so wrong (laughs) it's not a rare occurrence to be fair Uh, um it is you I will get on to this in like a moment it is really interesting um who is picked to be a regent so for example 
there's differences um, and this really varies like nationally but it would primarily be a close member of the king's family so sometimes it'd be his mother sometimes it could be his wife but it might also be a powerful uncle there'd be members of the government could also be appointed as a region or a regency council so sometimes it's all vested in one person sometimes it's vested in like a group of people so you um, sort of mentioned already didn't you that when when there's a need for it so if the king or the queen is uh, incompetent or ill or out of the country or if you have a child any others uh no those are the main instances when you have a region so it's going to be when the king is either physically or mentally not there sorry mentally not that sounds like they, they're disengaged a bit well they were we were henry the <laughs> sixth yes like that but it was yeah george the third slightly different but yeah absolutely so I mean, as you've kind of pointed out with Henry VIII, so he's away fighting. So that's an instance where he's fully able to appoint someone to rule in his absence. And kind of sticking on that Henry VIII theme. So, for instance, when he dies, he sets up a regency council of 16 members to rule um, for Edward VI. Mm. However, this council nominate Edward's uncle, Edward Seymour, the Duke of Somerset, as protector, which grants Somerset these greater powers to rule as an individual regent supported by the council rather than having this power sharing basis so that kind of goes to show that how flexible these arrangements can be at times so although a council might be set up there will still be uh, someone in place who could have overarching power so the bottom line is it was never the same thing twice really yeah pretty much so some rulers occasionally do have a partner who they co-rule with and trust to act as a regent for the entirety of their reign but some regencies are very dependent on the balance of power between factions which allow other people to come to the fore and take place as regents so as we see with Edward the sixth reign it does jump up and down a bit between who's got the kind of like control of the regency power so uh, regency william council. and mary is that an instance of ruling together Yes, yeah. So that's a really good example of co-rulership. So that sharing of power and uh, not necessarily one's appointed just as a regent to have kind of overarching power, but a decision to kind of rule separately in places. So how do queens come into all of this? So queens would come into this because they could and were nominated as regents across the medieval period. However, it's a bit more difficult to identify when this happens for several reasons. So, like I mentioned, there's a lack of formal arrangements, there's a lack of documentation, which makes it difficult to identify when a queen's chosen. And interestingly, when the documentation does survive, the vocab used is often genders male, such as magister, there's not a female equivalent to that. And the titles and roles are associated with a male regent and not a queen consort or a queen mother. So it's a bit more difficult to unpick when the queens actually do appear. Um, so a queen mother would be expected to kind of take on more of a kind of caregiving, like guardian type role, whereby she'd look after the king's personal sphere and arrangements and not necessarily rule. However, there are several instances in England and France. For example, Eleanor of Aquitaine, who we get onto in a bit, and Blanche of Castile. We can really clearly see that queen mothers can work as effective rulers on behalf of their sons. They do come into the political sphere, and that's regardless of whether they're a child king or an absent adult ruler. And really interestingly, like both Blanche of Castile and Eleanor of Aquitaine are chosen by their sons to act as regents when their sons are adults and went on crusade. So it clearly shows that the sons do trust their mothers to be able to act as on their behalf as a region so it doesn't have to go to a male relative or to a council the queens very much can come into the sphere and rule for them so was it an unusual thing to have a mother or a wife as a region it's not unusual it's not entirely common it's a bit like having a regnant queen so a ruling queen in this period um people are aware it's a possibility i would say it's more uncommon to have a mother rule than a wife as there's more opportunities for the king to require his co-ruling queen his consort to rule in his stead whilst he's absent or for a wife to take power during a time of incapacitation than there is for a mother to intervene 
uh, so kind of sticking with the theme of like Richard and Eleanor. So Richard choosing Eleanor to rule rather than his wife would be seen as a slight change from the norm. However, given Eleanor had so much experience in rulership, this put her in good stead to be an informal regent whilst Richard's on crusade. And Richard does leave behind a regency council was set up in government for them to rule, but it's really clear that Eleanor was quite heavily involved in the 1190s for ruling. So we will come on to Eleanor more, but yeah. let's talk about famous regents in history um, that we should know about, like household names. Oh, Eleanor and Blanche would be the two who I think are most noticeable, definitely for the medieval period. Mm. Another really good example is William Marshall, who is part of the triumvirate, the regency council for Henry III when he's a child king. Isabeau of Bavaria is another really interesting one. She rules on behalf of Charles VI when he undergoes his episodes of psychosis in the 14th century. Mm -hmm. And then I was also going to bring up kind of George IV. That's not a familiar name for a lot of people because he acts as Prince Regent on behalf of his father from 1811 to about 1820. So So let's start with Blanche. Yes. Blanche of Castile rules as a regent on two occasions. So she rules during the minority reign of her son, Louis VII, so from 1226 to 1234, so whilst he's still a child. And then she rules again as regent from 1258 until 1252 when he is away on crusade. So I think that's a really interesting uh, development it's a really interesting turn of events because it's not usual that you would act as a regent for a child king and then again uh, whilst they're an adult you would kind of expect that Louis would have appointed his wife to rule in his stead or to set up a regency council or to do something slightly different than appoint his mother again so and she wielded quite a lot of power while she was doing so. She's known as quite a forthright character and really makes sure that France is run effectively whilst Louis absent. Who was next on our list? William Marshall. Let's, do you know why? Because I can't, I forget reminding me names. I can't remember unless they're written down in front of me. So um, <laughs> I will be asking you who is next. <laughs> So William Marshall is our next one because you've just said it. Tell us more about him. Yep. So William Marshall's quite famous for his soldiering, so for his um, military activities, for his skills as a leader, and so on. And he also lives a really long time. Right. Uh, Seventy-two, which is quite old for this period. Um, and. When John dies in 1216, he leaves behind his son, uh, Henry III, and as the Baron's Wars going on, and it's a period of like real instability. And when upon John's death, William Marshall is named by the King's Council, so the chief barons who were loyal to John in the war, to serve as the protector of nine-year-old Henry III and become regent so despite the fact that he is you know around 70 at this point he continues to fight Henry's cause he uh, leads the war against Prince Louis in France he continues to uh, fight against the barons and really defends Henry's interests I think he's just got a really interesting life so even though the regency kind of makes up a the end of his life that really short period he's a really kind of fascinating character from a military perspective to look into and see how he survives all this changing uh, political dynamics throughout the 12th and 13th century i'm pretty sure alina that james was banging on about him a lot when we were doing the greatest britain but possibly but i love you very much james but i I might not have been listening (laughs) (laughs) Um, oh, okay. Uh, tell us about t- tell us about Margaret of Anjou and Henry the Sixth because I love this one. She she was a badass, wasn't she? 
she was a really she's such an interesting character and i think she had had a bit of kind of um slack in a way because so often i remember looking at her at a levels and a lot of the textbooks we were kind of given were saying oh you know she's like a bad influence because she was um viewed as like this kind of foreign french woman who's coming over and she was trying to um implement french rule and she was trying to do this and so on and actually i think she's in a bit of a bad situation to be honest she's in a bit of a grind where she's got her poor husband who's obviously incapacitated she's got her son she's trying to look after and she's also got um obviously all the nobility around her and the various factions causing um chaos in the way because there's just no they really need to kind of rule effectively in this period and there's just a lot of factionalism going on as part of wars of the roses as well so in terms of um her regency and in terms of the regencies around henry the sixth so i think it's important to note that when henry the sixth and margaret's son is born in 1453 henry then suffers a complete breakdown at this point um and you know there's rumors going around that actually maybe it wasn't henry's son and that margaret had had an affair see i Um, did this at a level and my teacher was very much like i'm sorry but she produced this baby and he was in a catatonic trance it's highly unlikely that he would have been able yeah absolutely so there is doubts around it but then it's also one of those kind of things of we can't go back in time do we know how incapacitated he actually was was it more severe than what's reported or was, was there blown... a propaganda where they use it was edward the fourth using it and like making it sound worse than it was yeah absolutely so i think margaret's kind of attempts at rulership um are really indicative of her trying to protect her son and her interests and i think it's just a case of in this period there's a lot of uh, instability really there's a lot of fighting for the regency and for control right i'm going to do my usual so we've got one more to add to this list again you listed us off a long list of names i've forgotten who it was i know it's a woman (laughs) (laughs) tell us about this incredible woman okay so this is isabeau of bavaria and she is wife of Charles the Sixth of France, who is known for being, you know how they always give like epithets to mm. kings, don't they? He's Charles the Mad. So it's <laughs> so already got a good start for him. <laughs> no. So she Charles the Sixth has kind of frequent episodes of psychosis and it is from thirteen ninety three onwards that Isabeau really starts to take control of France because Charles is just so incapacitated and it's really from this point on that we start to see kind of factions um, being established at the royal court so they set up a regency council to kind of rule in Charles' stead which Isabeau presides over and the factions here is you've got Isabeau and Louis I who's the Duke of Orléans the king's brother um, who's alleged to be the Queen's lover because, you know, there's always one of those that pops up, isn't there? <laughs> well, there's happen. always that accusation that pops up, even if it's not true, isn't there? Yeah. yeah. It's a bit yeah. of slut shaming. Yeah. And then you've got the other kind of ru- uh, predominant rulers in France. So you've got Philip the Bold, Duke of Burgundy, who had also been the regent during Charles's minority. And you've got Charles's other uncles, Louis II of Naples and John Duke of Berry. And what happens is the factions kind of derive between the Queen's party and the Orleans and uh, the Burgundians. And it's really, it does turn into a 
quite a severe factional conflict and result medieval east enders yeah <laughs> yeah absolutely so it then turned into the armagnac burgundian civil war which lasts from about 1407 until 1435 so this goes beyond charles's reign and it's really just it it leads to so many kind of issues because Charles's reign is really marked by the Hundred Years' War and they kind of try and resolve this with lots of kind of marital alliances and it results in the Treaty of Troyes in 1420 where Henry is then kind Henry the Fifth of England is named as Charles's successor and all of this kind of losing the war against the English, this disinheritance of the Prince of France, really kind of leads to a lot of accusations against Isabeau for not managing to run France properly. So I think she's an interesting regent from... Mm. I was going to say, how does she fare in all of this madness? Yeah, so it's really kind of difficult for her. So in terms of she as this kind of like period goes on so from 1393 through until about 1420 her power does grow she then manages to kind of assume a role of sole regent at some point but she has to yield her position as the civil war continues it's really kind of putting on pressure with Isabeau in terms of um how she's going to rule and like we said there's rumours circulating about her about her lifestyle about who then gets appointed as regent so she is pushed out one of the most famous accusations lodged against Isabeau is that she was a poisoner and wife murderer so she apparently goes almost as mad as her husband but really how much of this is again kind of slander and propaganda because I'm not saying she made the wisest decisions as regent Mm. but she definitely led quite an eventful life, shall we say, amongst trying to then rule for her husband, but ultimately seizing power for herself. I like her. <laughs> she sounds like a badass. I you should get an episode done on her. These she are someone who, to, who can speak about Isabeau. And because you probably... said she was of Bavaria, or I picture her with like a tankard in each hand and like, Lady Lederhosen and stuff. Oh, it got me too. Wow. <laughs> well, we are such amateurs with medieval history, aren't we? <laughs> so, mate, we've got me with my I once studied this for GC uh, A level, and you with your. Uh, there were some names and I've forgotten them. And poor Gabby is trying to like, educate us. So, tell us that we are not morons or total morons when it comes to Eleanor of Aquitaine. So, is this the most famous regent queen of the medieval period? Definitely for England. I think I would probably face a little bit of opposition from some of my medievalist colleagues if I said she was the most famous because I think some would probably argue that Blanche is more famous or Mm. kind of worthy of attention. But as I kind of mentioned the last time I was on, Eleanor leads such a long life and when she acts as regent, so she rules England on behalf of her husband Henry II in the 1150s. She also travels to their lands in continental France so she gets to rule Maine for a bit as well and she is also ruling Aquitaine which is her own duchy so that's not her acting as a regent there but just her acting as its duchess. Um, which really kind of demonstrates this element of co-rulership between them but also the power balance like Henry quite clearly trusts Eleanor to be able to work effectively on his behalf whilst he's kind of dashing around all over the place trying to implement his rule and then you've also got Eleanor acting as a regent for her son Richard whilst he goes on crusades which I've mentioned a bit before so Richard doesn't formally appoint her as regent it's again quite difficult to establish the processes for nominating regents in this period and they do have kind of a council or appointed figures in government who assist Eleanor with ruling but it's really clear in the 1190s that she's still acting as a kick-ass queen to be honest she is still 
you know, exercising all this power. She's getting stuff done. She raises the ransom for when Richard's captured on crusade. You know, she's just cracking on with it, really. And in this period, she is, God, in her 70s. Yeah. So, really just cracking on with stuff. And then when Richard dies in 1199, Brother John comes to the throne. And Eleanor's still, again, employed as a regent. She's still looking after the continental land whilst John's trying to deal with his accession in England. And then there's the wars in France. And... she still continues kind of getting involved in the rulership of the land. Like I say, it's not particularly formalised, but it is very clear that she's there. She is acting as a regent. She is exercising a great deal of authority and showing how, you know, how important she is to the running of um, the Ongevin domains. I really want to know, though, what, so you, you've got lots of women ruling in very turbulent times why do you think so that all of your medievalist colleagues don't scream at you for being wrong why do you (laughs) think she was so successful i think she's largely successful because she has this prior experience because of her longevity so she becomes duchess of aquitaine when she's 15 and she then becomes queen consort of france shortly after and although she wasn't largely involved in ruling France her experience in Aquitaine in particular gives her like this wealth of um, skills it gives her the experience which grows and grows as she becomes consort and dowager so I think her success is kind of born from the fact she's able to rule from a young age and she just lives so long because it gives her more opportunities it gives her more chance to act effectively and uh, she was a good ruler You know, she wasn't kind of, you know, spending loads of money. She might have incurred a bit of wrath from her enemies for uh, taking control of things. But she had access to resources. And it's quite clear that both her husband and her sons do trust her to be able to rule effectively. So I've kind of got to point out this is at the detriment to her daughters-in-law. Right. You just mentioned the daughters-in-law. How do they come into this? Yes. So, as I possibly mentioned the last time I was on, so the two daughters-in-law, which should have had some power here, uh, Berengaria of Navarre, which is Richard's wife, and Isabella of Angoulême, who's John's wife. And Berengaria has no previous experience of ruling, and she doesn't appear to have been allowed any opportunities to do so due to Eleanor's dominance. Yeah, this is literally like sit your ass down. Mum's yeah. got this. <laughs> yeah, so you know she might have had opportunities to rule. She could have been quite effective at it, but Eleanor's kind of experience here really um, just lead to her being picked time after time. And Berengaria and Richard, as we kind of know, don't have any children, so this isn't an avenue that Berengaria can kind of go down, saying, oh, maybe I could become a regent mother or something instead. It's just completely shut off to her. And then with Isabella, it's a bit clearer that she's not chosen because she's so young. Um, Then she has five kids in quick succession. Um, But there were more opportunities where she could have ruled. And upon John's death, when this Regency Council formed with William Marshall, Isabella's not included from, uh, Isabella's excluded from this. So there's a really kind of interesting chapter by Louise Wilkinson talking about why Isabella leaves England after exclusion and was this maternal abandonment and what's going on. But Berenger and Isabella, they're just not given these opportunities to act as regent. Their husbands just are so controlling. They just don't give them access to resources or the opportunities to really rule. So it is partially due to kind of Eleanor's success, Eleanor's experience as a regent, which is why her daughters-in-law are pushed out a bit. But it's also due to the fact that Richard and John just don't want to get their wives involved, to be honest. (laughs) <laughs> it's a sad indictment isn't it because they're obviously open to female leadership and like putting a woman in charge because they go with Eleanor but they've obviously looked at their wives and thought nah screw that yeah but let's for whatever reason with, let's stick with mum on this one and we will just crack on a bit 
<laughs> I really want to ask. So if I, if we were to say to you, you can now sell a regent who no one's going to have heard of, but you just think someone should pay attention to tell our listeners who, who should they know more about? I don't want to kind of focus on Western Europe in a way because mm. that's like my go-to and I feel everyone should, I feel everyone should just know about Isabel of Barrera in a way because she's so interesting, but I what think answer would all... Eleanor Yanaga give us being like slightly more she she does check stuff doesn't she as well I think of like a weird Asian one to be honest like um whose name I'm gonna absolutely slaughter in a minute Empress Sian mm-hmm. um in the 19th century she is a really kind of interesting figurehead to look at so there we go that's a non-European one and Elizabeth of Bosnia, there we go. She's Queen Consort and Regent of Hungary and Croatia, and she's Queen Consort of Poland. There we go, that's three for one. Oh, so how does that come about? Do you know much about her? I know we're taking you completely out of your comfort zone now, haven't we? Yeah, so she becomes Queen of Poland um, when her husband, Louis, uh, be- funny enough, becomes King of Poland, which is in 1370. And then when Louis dies in 1382, their daughter Mary succeeds um, to the throne of Poland. And Elizabeth begins to act as regent here. So she can't kind of manage this union of Hungary and Poland. So Elizabeth secures the Polish throne for her youngest daughter, who's called Hedwig. There we go. Weird Harry Potter reference in there. But in, in Polish, it's Jadwiga, just, just so you know oh, that. No, no one cares, sure. Alina. They all want the no, fluffy white bird from Harry Potter. <laughs> I and do apologise, Alina. <laughs> no, no. Do you know why? It's, it, it's my grandmother's name. And um, we always used to laugh at her that it was Hedwig in English and Jadwiga in Polish. So sounds, just a little tidbit. It sounds better in Polish, to be fair. <laughs> it does. It sounds a lot better than Hedwig. It, let's be honest um yeah so there we go we've got elizabeth of bosnia so 1380s um trying to rule over poland and hungary and acting as a regent for her daughters so there we go quite a different turn of events rather than a son she's acting as regent for her daughters we need her on pole position <laughs> yeah we absolutely do that would be good I will go. find us. No, no pressure, Gabby, but you need to go away and become an expert in her now. <laughs> exactly. I was going to say, like, um, Cassina um, Cosio, she's done a couple for you. She, I don't know if that's necessarily quite in her time frame or not. But She could find us someone. I know she's, she's already done the hunt for us for medieval historians. So, <laughs> we, we, Kasia, we love you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. So... No, I was going to say, and if you need people who like want to speak about child kingship and so on in this period, um, Emily Ward is fantastic at that, if you wanted to delve into other regencies and stuff a bit more. But yeah, Poland is a little bit out of my reach, I'm afraid. It's a shame, because it's, uh, it's all funky stuff, you know. I love listening to some of the other people you've had on here talking about bits of history I just don't know about. And clearly, you do know your bits fine because you're a doctor now. Yes, congratulations, <laughs> <laughs> Gabby. Thanks so much for coming on to give us a bit of an overview on regencies and medieval queens trying to boss it in a, a wholly male world. Um, I like that there's a few of them out there kicking against the grain. Yeah, absolutely. It's really interesting, really different. Like I say, just looking at kind of regent mothers and. Um, queen consorts who become regent it's really kind of fascinating to get that extra spin on how they rule so yeah more kick-ass queens kick-ass queens all the way well you got loads of time on your hands now you can write a book <laughs> <laughs> you know what i came out of my viva last week and we kind of like publications I'm like yep i've got four things i want to do work out which one of them to do first <laughs> Isn't it always the way? I think I've got about six projects on the go at the moment and I'm just not achieving anything in any of them because I'm too thinly spread. Florian first world problems. Yeah, absolutely. We just get interested in so much stuff, don't we? We just end up down these rabbit holes and we're like, do you know what? No one's done that. I'll do it. And like, hang on. 
oh no one's done this right do you know what let's do it and then before you know it you're like i have so much yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nerdy rabbit holes is what we yeah. all do best awesome yeah. thank you Join us tomorrow when Rachel Lance will be with us to talk all about the mystery of the Hunley. This is brilliant. So this is one of the first submarines. It's American Civil War. And uh, we'll let her tell you the story. But basically, they found all of the guys still in there and dead without a mark on them. And she decided that in order to do her doctorate, she was going to blow stuff up and figure out what happened. It's a brilliant story. So don't miss that one. And then join us down the pub and we will be debating history's greatest ever love story. Um, yeah. But this is Alina's one and uh, it should be funny because you know us. We're not capable of doing sappy. Uh, so I'm sure it'll be entertaining. Don't miss that one. Don't forget that we do exist on Patreon as History Hack and on Patreon as well, which is Podbean's own version. Uh, Alina and I have had massive fun doing this in 2020, uh, but life's going to change quite a lot next year and we're going to actually have to go and earn a living, etc. If we want to keep up the regularity that we've been bringing you and the kind of guests that we've been bringing you and the workload, then we will need your help. So uh, if you join us on either of those platforms uh, marcus is currently working on some benefits for you so uh, there's going to be incentives for joining on either of those platforms we're revamping ourselves on both of them so don't forget to go in you can do as little as a dollar a month and it all goes towards keeping up history hack as regular as we've been able to bring it to you this year we are now on YouTube. We are posting all of our new episodes on there and we have our own channel and we are gradually posting all of the back episodes because we have been made aware of the fact that you can only find the last hundred on some platforms. So you can go and listen to your heart's content and laugh at the cartoons and have a great time. So do go over there and subscribe.